VA 2014-03. Yes, sir. This is a plan development request by Doug Carter for a mixed commercial and office plan development located in CM zoning. Property is located at 1420 Gornter Road and consists of almost three and a half acres. Um, as you see on the map on the screen, and it's also in your packet, there's currently four existing parcels. Um, they are currently in the process of going through the subdivision review to combine those parcels into one um, to just make it easier so there's no internal property lines that can foul them up later. Um, as many plan development requests often are, particularly one with a few acres, they can be rather complicated. Um, this particular property is further complicated by its location. Um, as you see on the map, it does not front a public street. Its only means of access is a 20-foot wide access easement that runs along the railroad track and is currently a gravel driveway. Um, the easement is on the other property, not the subject property. Um, that is an easement that dates back several decades and has been in place. This property um, from here southward was once a Lowndes County Island in an incorporated area. Um, it was annexed back in 2006. It had CN zoning in the county. It was given CN zoning upon annexation. Um, it actually had board on the industrial use. I vaguely recall many years ago, I think it had M1 zoning once upon a time. Um, the uses were large commercial buildings, um, metal siding. Um, the site plan in the packet shows where those buildings are. Um, the applicant has purchased the property a couple of years ago, has moved into the front building and is setting up there as a used merchandise store. That's how we classify it. It's an antique shop uh, with some household goods. Those are permitted uses in CN zoning. Um, however, the property, given its difficulty for redevelopment, uh, it's in terms of access, it's also in the floodplain, um, there's extreme buffer requirement, uh, things of that nature make it hard to develop conventionally. So in order to further the redevelopment idea, the applicant has put together a master plan for non-conventional development. In other words, you get some flexibility in terms of development standards, but still adhere to the uses allowed in CN. And that is what is in your packet, and that is what has been reviewed. Zoning pattern um, on the map on the screen it is a commercial area that is between residential um, you have the older neighborhood from the 1950s that's to the east on the other side of Sugar Creek. You see that long um, yellow parcel to the east that is actually city-owned property that is associated with the floodplain and the floodway of Sugar Creek. There's no development there, um, but you see the residential lots to the east. Um, to the west is the Norfolk Southern Railroad track, and to the west of that you see an area of R15 that is actually a utility substation. Um, the rest of it is R10. Those are the residential lots of New Wood Valley. And then to the north, you see the little bit of commercial zoning and therefore commercial development along Hornchow Road. This property is very isolated. Um, it cannot be seen readily from the east or the west, and even blocked from the north because of the development along Hornchow Road. And that in itself even poses some interesting challenges. Um, there's the aerial. You can see some of the rooftops of the houses. You certainly see the utility substation. Um, the property sits low because it is very much in the creek valley of Sugar Creek. So looking out of the property east to west, you are looking uphill, and of course into some trees. Um, here's some pictures. The upper left picture is the access driveway coming from Barnshire Road looking south. Um, this is not the subject property immediately in the foreground, but in the back you see sort of a, a, a passageway through some an existing tree line. That's actually the edge of the subject property. Um, on the right is a picture taken within the interior. Um, and then the bottom of the picture is the one of the larger buildings that's there. You see it has existing gravel driveway and a gravel parking. And then within, you see some of the development that's already occurring on the subject property. And these were taken, I guess, in the past week or two when the signs were posted. Adjacent, you see the pattern of uh, commercial properties to the north, on the railroad track, which is the bottom picture. Um, and so on. The development plan that's in your packet, um, for hard copy purposes, I try to print it out on 11 by 17 just so it's a little bit easier to read. There's two existing buildings there that they are proposing to keep. The northern building we call building A. The building to the south we call building C. 
and people will ask, where is building B? Well, building B does not exist, um, or at least not yet. And the reason is A and C because of addressing purposes, because these are existing separate parcels of land. As you see on this plan, there's a, an existing vacant lot between the buildings that has sort of been set aside as a potential future building B. So for identification purposes, that's what we're calling it. Building A is 4,000 square feet. That is the existing retail store. Building C is currently authorized as a grandfathered in warehouse. That is from back in the days when this was in the unincorporated Lowndes County area. It does not have a certificate of occupancy, um, but it is fine for personal storage and warehousing. The applicant is proposing to convert building C to retail space. Also his professional office, he has an interior design business, that is to locate in building C as part of some very expensive renovations. In between, you see an area that's um, delineated as outdoor display area, takes up all of the space between buildings A and C, and a little bit in front of the buildings. To the rear of both buildings, going back towards Sugar Creek, you see outdoor display area, but that's also outdoor storage. It is currently marked or separated off by an opaque fence. And then along Sugar Creek, you see the boundary line, um, a stream buffer that has been denoted here. And that is 50 feet wide back from the top of the bank of Sugar Creek. Um, parts of Sugar Creek's bank run right along the property line, but for a good chunk of it, it is several feet into the other property. You also see the SS notation here that is actually a very large city of Alasta sewer line that comes through this property that follows the creek, and there is an easement associated with that. Um, looking at building C, you can see there's the 6,000 square feet that's current building. There's an additional 2,500 square feet on the back side that is currently a covered porch. It is simply a shed roof that extends out over a dirt area that has no walls. The applicant long term is wanting to enclose that space and use it for additional retail. Um, next to building C, you see future or proposed parking. Um, is proposing it to be either gravel or grass, sort of keeping with the unpaid theme that it started. And then to the south of there, you see storage trailers that are nested with the loading dock. Those are currently existing. And those are six semi-trailers that sort of back up to one another. Beyond that, you're really getting down into the low, low part uh, with wetlands and floodplain very difficult to develop. Um, it is not proposed for development at this time simply to remain undisturbed. Um, beyond that, there's some other notes on here regarding the site plan as best we can separate them in a black and white pattern. Um, in your packet, there are review criteria for plan development um, where the applicant's responses and staffs have been placed there. Um, there's a letter of intent that was written by the applicant's attorney who's representing him. Um, so with all of that in mind, with plan development, staff is finding the re overall request consistent with our conference plan and our plan development criteria, and we're recommending approval with a series of conditions. And there are actually now 11 of them. 10 of them are articulated in your packet. Um, I will not read all of those unless you really, really want me, but we've already been here for a while. But there are some proposed changes. Uh, right before the meeting, I passed out an addendum page that has some yellow highlighting on it. And uh, let me run through that. So for condition number one, the proposal is to change the latter part of the language to read driveways and parking areas within the site may be unpaved and shall adequately support the weight of emergency vehicles in accordance with the fire code. The unpaved services shall be properly maintained to the satisfaction of the city engineer and fire marshal. That is very similar to the original language that we gave you at the work session. Um, skipping down to number three, or let me just cover these in general. Number two is to combine those four parcels into one, which that process has already started. Number three is to simplify and we reword that. Number three has to do with the floodplain issue. Anytime you were to build a building in floodplain or to expand an existing building, and the term building is very important here, that floor elevation of the building must be at least two feet above the flood level as established by FEMA. This entire property, all 3.44 acres, is within the floodplain. Um, 
the edge of the floodplain is up along the railroad track, so that's the high part. The existing buildings are down a few feet lower. Any expansions to the buildings trigger compliance with this, um, whether it be a new building or an expansion. And the, the main point of concern is the covered porch on the back of Building C that is currently at grade below flood level. There are some processes possible through FEMA review where you can extend a building outward, but it, you know, perhaps let the flood waters enter or exit the space so you do not take away from the volume of the flood plain. There's several different ways to look at that from an engineering standpoint. None have been chosen just yet, has not been reviewed by engineers. Um, so to simplify that, the proposal is to read word number three to read, all new buildings or building expansions or enclosures constructed on the site shall comply with all applicable FEMA guidelines and requirements. And that just about goes without saying anyway, but we simply put it on here more as informational purposes so it does not get forgotten. All right, conditions four, five, and six are important. Um, number four is to connect the buildings to the city's water and sewer system. Um, part of this property is still a mystery. We know building A is connected at least to the water. We're not sure about the sewer. Building C, we cannot, there are bathrooms there, but we cannot find any record of connection. And there has been no utilities plan yet prepared for this site. So as part of preparing that plan, those questions would be answered. Number five is upgrade the existing main driveway to better allow for two-way traffic flow and support and weight of emergency vehicles and to install a proper driveway apron at the entrance of Porto uh, Road. Currently, it is a substandard driveway. Even as driveways go, it is narrow, it is out of gravel. The concern is as that expands with new gravel southward into the site, supporting the weight of a 75,000 pound fire truck becomes interesting. Um, there are ways to do that with gravel. It is difficult, but possible. Pavement is sometimes easier. Both could be expensive. Um, the entrance drive itself from Barto is narrow. It is wide enough to accommodate one vehicle safely. So there is a concern of a vehicle exiting the site while another one is trying to enter. So these recommendations are from the engineering department and it's simply to upgrade those things at a minimum to make it more safe. Number six deals with vegetation in the buffers. Um, traditionally, a buffer is required you're next to a different zoning district such as residential. And the only place that triggers is along the creek itself because on the other side you have residential zoning. The commercial zonings to the north and south do not trigger buffer yard requirements, nor is a buffer yard required conventionally along the railroad track. So as part of the plan development where you get some give and take with the, with the development standards, we're requesting that in lieu of buffer yard along the east boundary, simply restore the screen buffer that should be there anyway. Um, and in exchange, is to exempt the property from internal landscaping as required by the parking. Part of the justification for unpaid parking is the floodplain itself. We're certainly wanting to minimize stormwater runoff, particularly in close proximity to Sugar Creek. So that is good reason there. And it's not a very, very high traffic kind of use so there is not a great level of concern with that. All right, number seven has to do with the outdoor st uh, storage trailers. There's currently six with the loading dock. The recommendation here is simply cap it at six. Use what is already existing. All right, number eight talks about dumpsters and refuse containers. There are currently none on the site. Uh, so when, if those appear, that they be put in the appropriate place. Number nine has to do with signage. Um, this is tied to the CN signing uh, signing standards, which are very restrictive. Um, we have gone up above the minimum requirements for CN. CN only allows up to a 32 square foot sign. We're recommending approval with 75 square feet for freestanding and up to 150 square feet for building. That is more like the CC and CH standards that you see on these neighboring commercial properties. The property is somewhat encumbered by the fact that you cannot see it from more to the road. So signage on this property is just going to be difficult to see. But once you get into the property and you have the two buildings, we think certainly directional signage and labeling signage on the buildings become important. So this allows the freedom and the flexibility in a generous way to have signage back in the property. 
Number 10 is really the important one. I'll go ahead and read that. Within 60 days, submit complete building plans and a site plan for building C as required for the permitting review process to address existing renovation work that has already been completed, as well as a uh, as proposed additional work to be done in order to obtain a CO for this building as its intended use. Also submit other applicable plans and documents as required to address overall development issues relating to land disturbance, stormwater management, utilities connections, outdoor storage, and landscape. That's a whole lot in one paragraph. Basically boils down to, with the proposed redevelopment and current redevelopment activities, submit the plans that are required to go through that full review process and see what the details are that come out of that. Um, that is the standard review process. We're requesting to add number 11. That was cracked literally this afternoon. And that is an overall expiration date. You may recall when we've had plan developments in the past, and certainly with our conditional uses, we put an expiration date on there. Initially, I had thought number 10 with that 60-day time frame would be an expiration date, but there is the possibility that you could follow one through 10, meet the 60 day requirement, get your plans approved, and still not do anything. Uh, so we'll, in keeping with our tradition and even code requirements for plan development expirations, there needs to be a final sunset date on here. Um, because there are some outstanding issues with the property that need to be addressed even for the current use of the property, um, some of these things truly need to be dealt with. So for number 11, we are proposing plan development shall expire in one year from the date of city council approval if conditions four through six listed above are not completed and satisfied by that time. And if you look back at four through six or four, five, and six, that has to do with the driveway and the screen buffer um, and the utilities connections. Um, those are areas that the property is currently deficient in and those really ought to be taken care of sooner rather than later. All right, lots to cover. We talked about 45 minutes about this at the work session. Um, the applicants are here, um, and there may be a lot of questions yet to come, but I'll try to answer any you might have for staff. Any questions for staff? I have just one clarification on item three that's been added. All new buildings and, and uh, expansions and exposures enclosures constructed on the site shall comply with applicable FEMA guidelines and requirements. I'm assuming that will not negate any local codes or anything like that. No. All the, locals will still be. Correct. All codes applicable. are in full force in effect. This is simply a reminder that FEMA codes are still there and applicable <clears throat> because it's in the floodplain. The concern from the applicants was the wording of the old number three uh, more or less mandated the two-year elevation of a floodplain. Yeah. Um, conventionally, that is a requirement. However, there are alternatives possible through FEMA, depending on exactly what you're wanting to do. Because the engineers have not really looked at this and gone to that level of detail, it's all supposition. So until that happens, we didn't want to tie the hands. But FEMA has got to be followed, just the same as local codes do. And from under, excuse me, and one more thing. Outstanding issues, I presume you're talking about electrical and, and, and lighting and things of that nature. Right. And as you see in the pictures, I mean, there's been some renovation work done to these buildings, particularly Building C. Uh, building C has no permit approval for it whatsoever. It's been grandfathered in as a warehouse, it's been used for storage. Um, there's some speculation as to maybe there's some other activity going on there, but it needs to be properly reviewed and planned, given a certificate of occupancy, and taken care of. That's all part of the outstanding. That is correct. And then also some of the driveway work has gone ahead and been done already. No review for that. But we all knew there was a planned development process coming to address all of these issues simultaneously. So the city has been patiently waiting on this process to get here, and it is finally here. Um, but that, that's what I mean by outstanding issues. Just a few questions. Well, one for Condition 10 and 11. Um, is the 
the proposed time limitation, has, is that acceptable? Is it adequate time for the applicant to be able to provide within the 60 days the required drawings needed? Do you know if that's Yes, it? they've actually done some work on the drawings. Okay. Um, and all of these conditions, I've had several conversations with the applicant's representative even as of late this afternoon. Okay. Hence, some of these changes. Okay. <coughs> so both of those durations are adequate. Yes, and actually, some of the items in number ten can be and maybe should be done a little sooner, mm -hmm. but some of them would take longer, such as stormwater management plan, that type of thing. Um, Sixty days is plenty of time to do that. They've already got surveys for the property. Some of the building plans have already been drawn in, in a sketch format. Mm -hmm. um, they're already underway. Um, but this is not a day to a time frame to complete stuff. It is simply a time frame to get in full set of plans for review mm -hmm. to come later. Mm -hmm. Can I have a question? Go ahead. Uh, Matt, uh, look at the number four. I a few quick questions on that. Uh, talking about connecting water and sewer. Did you just say that building A did have city water on it? Right. City utility staff have been out there a couple times. They've checked their records. This used to be an unappropriate allowance count. So there was, there's no record, per se, of it connecting to the city, although they do have an active water and sewer account with the city for Building A. So they get sewer on that building also? Well, they have an account. Okay? <laughs> the utility staff could not find the actual sewer connection, could not find the clean-outs and so forth. There's some question. The property used to be occupied by a building contract, uh, electrical contractor and I think a plumbing contractor in terms of building. Yeah, and we're not sure over the decades what has gone on here. Um, there is water service to the buildings. They do have presumably functioning bathrooms. But that water and sewer 2C, we didn't know the city water and sewer. And there may be a well and septic on the property, or it may be tied in to the city system the old-fashioned way <coughs> from years ago. And it's simply a matter of in the utilities plan that's required under number 10 to simply show what is currently existing and if that needs to be fixed, then show how it is to be fixed. Just, just concerning the language of number three, I know I personally was on one of those islands in the county that the city annexed in. Or number four, you mean? Yes, number four, I'm sorry, sir. Number four, mm -hmm. I was on one of those islands and uh, I think the language that they gave to us was if your septic tank system fails, or your well fails, you have no choice but to tile. Mm -hmm. But in, in this language here, he has to move forward immediately to tile all the land. Correct. I mean, part of this is concern is a <coughs> system that's active in close proximity to Sugar Creek and in the floodplain is a problem. Um, they're, we're believing there's already connections, but we need to validate those and make sure they're connected properly. Yeah. But yes, this is in very much the heart of the city urban development with environmental issues on the land, it truly needs to be connected to water and sewer. And, and one more thing about uh, about the installation of the fire hydrant air. I know probably that it would probably be a good thing, but uh, make that mandatory is pretty strong. That is a fire code requirement to properly protect the buildings. There may be some alternatives to it. I actually had a conversation with the fire marshal this afternoon to see if there was other possibilities, knowing that it's a few hundred feet of pipe and then at least one fire hydrant. Um, the closest fire hydrant is on the other side of Borntow Road. Um, the Borntow Road itself is over 300 feet from the entrance of this property, and you've got to get across Borntow and down a little bit. The fire hose does not reach all that far, um, so getting to the property of the fire hose is a problem. There really needs to be a fire hydrant. And that would be true of any development. You've got to be able to protect it. There are some alternatives if there's another way to provide adequate fire flows to a building. Fire Marshal told me this afternoon that it is possible, but in his view, probably more expensive to install a separate well pump for this property to protect the buildings of this size. Um, not knowing cost either way, but that's something that can be looked at. Um, but they're showing a new fire hydrant on their site plan that's in the center of the property between the buildings. So presumably the fire hose can stretch from there to cover all that it needs to cover. But that would still need to be verified through the plan review. Just, just curious, if the applicant, does, does, does he have the option to say, I know if the catch is on fire, 
somehow. Well, that the building doesn't... can't be occupied no. if that's the case. These are, these are fire codes mm -hmm. and building codes. They're not city codes. <laughs> Got members of the public going into the building and have to be protected. Can I follow up on the light for this issue a little bit? Same item. Apparently, the city was providing fire protection for the previous four years or however many years it's been annexing. On site, correct. That's why the uses there were just private storage. What would have happened if it weren't? You know, there, was, there was offices in there with people in them. Before you had existing development as a warehouse, grandfathered in from decades ago before changes. Obviously back then if it had been required, it would have been required to be installed. What you have before you is the <coughs> development of the property. And therefore new codes get looked at. And that includes fire codes. Well, if I may add also the change of occupancy would trigger um, different categories in the fire code as well. Right. So because there is a strategy from warehouse to use retail, for retail right? so it's, it's going to be a different hazard, and there's going to be different criteria. What you, you mentioned about there, the, the other options, I know uh, Sugar Creek. Sugar Creek. What would be uh, this is just just on the dry hydrant. They can meet the fire codes. Perhaps they can do that. You know, but I want to dry hydrant, just like the county has the dry hydrant goes into the uh, like a well. Yeah, it goes into the creek and it sucks out the creek. All right. No further questions. I'm going to open this up to mine. For anybody who wants to speak in favor. Shown on plan, yeah. There's a, one of the review comments is it's there's parking spaces in front of it. So even the parking spaces need to shift to move away from the hydrant, or the hydrant needs to shift to move away from the parking spaces. I want to get that in before we approve. And that that's all part of the plan review process that right. we have. All right. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak in favor of this request? Good evening, Commissioner Chairman. Bill Nigel, 1007 North Patterson Street. Thanks for allowing me to stand up here. My legs were going numb. Commission <laughs> agenda. Um, I think it's safe to say that before my client, Mr. Carter, purchased this property, it was a pretty blighted property. Um, you can look on your area here and see that it's littered with salvage and debris and cars and trailers. Um, yeah, Mr. Carter sort of took a leap of faith there uh, in more ways than one. But he, he's done a lot with this property. And I know a few of you have been there and visited over the weekend. And, uh, we appreciate y'all taking the time to go out and do that. Uh, the back has been cleaned up entirely. I mean, a lot of that debris, most of that debris was left by the previous owner. Mr. Carter's taken it his own initiative to get out there and clean it up and move it. Uh, 
about six of the trailers that were left. You know, he turned into storage facilities and built a fairly decent looking uh, novel uh, storage facility in my um, And I say that because, you know, if you stay on a piece of property that really I think was an eyesore for the community. And even though you can't, you can't see it from the one side, you can peek back there and see there's two big, ugly metal buildings that weren't really doing much. Um, that were sitting vacant. Nobody was doing anything with it. And, uh, you know, he's had ideas to bring his business back there and other businesses uh, to provide a, a destination for people in this community to go to shop for antiques, to get interior design consulting, uh, to build a tax base for this property. When it really wasn't there. Sales tax revenues, uh, with, with items that are being sold, uh, or not the Lauren property tax base through uh, renovations that have been done. To it. Now, you know this has been going on for for a long time. We've been working with the city for a long time, and uh, I sort of got pulled in about halfway through the process. And I, I think we all acknowledge that there was some work done, you know, out there that's not too code, and that's why we're here today. Um, and we're here to try and fix it, try and fix it in a, in a reasonable manner uh, without going too far down the road. Here. You know, one of the reasons I know there were some comments about uh, some of the electrical, uh, especially in that back deal, well, probably aren't going to be able to do anything. I mean, there, there's a stop work order issue, and so we haven't been able to address that until we get through these steps here. So if you went back there and you saw some some items that you know, looked a little, a little iffy, I mean, that's why. We haven't, the, the applicant hasn't been able to do anything with it. And we, we fully intend to now. But this is the first step with the PD application. And um, you know, as Mr. Martin said, the underlying zoning of CN will stay in place. The plan development application <coughs> was really put in place to address a number of, of uses uh, that weren't really allowed in CEO. Uh, this property is so unique and you know, the characteristics of it, uh, being in the floodplain, not having direct access uh, to Gornto, uh, pretty challenging. Um, so in order to address some of these challenges with the applicable zoning, Mr. Martin and I decided the plan development application would be a, a good starting point uh, to address things such as outside storage, to address items such as parking, um, you know, paving, striping. Obviously, we're in a 100 year floodplain. We don't want to add a bunch of impervious surface, I mean, more impervious surface than we have to. And I think that would be thought for leaving the gravel drive um, so the water could you know, percolate or something does it. Uh, you know, the city's working with us. With us, uh, they have imposed a laundry list of conditions that uh, y'all picked up on a few of them. Uh, quite frankly, I think are a little. Uh, even though they may uh, be there to comply with certain codes, I mean, a little far-reaching when you consider the fact that this property has been there and has been in the city for almost a decade, uh, and none of this stuff was required. And quite frankly, the uses haven't changed all that dramatically. I mean, this was a, I believe it was an electrical contract firm that had this property, that used it to store all their construction equipment and use it for their offices, both of um, I mean, if you go to the back warehouse now, there's a bathroom. There's, a, there's, there's an area partitioned off for an office. So there was an office there. It's not like we're changing the use that dramatic, if at all. Um, and I say that because as we walk through some of these conditions, um, I, I want you to keep that in mind, especially with respect to mandating a fire. Um, and, and Matt and I have Mr. Martin and I have, have gone back and forth and tried to address some of these conditions. Um, you know, quite frankly, they were sent to me uh, last week. I tried to meet the client and address some of them. Uh, and 
Matt and I talked through some of the wording. Uh, am I comfortable with all of them? Is my client comfortable with all of them? No. Uh, I mean, they're, they're going to require him to spend a lot of money. And uh, it's and not money you really anticipate spending. But um, I'd like to walk through the conditions now and just tell you our, our thoughts on them if we can. I know there's 11 of them. Uh, and I've got an old copy, so if I miss something. Um, the first co condition, uh, I, I believe, you know, we're, we're okay with, we're fine with. The last sentence we did want tweaked a little bit, and I'll tell you the reason for that. Uh, because on the initial draft, the, the word provided, I felt like that was made the fact that it would remain unpaid or conditional. And quite frankly, I didn't want uh, an issue to arise five years from now where Somebody came back and said, you've got to pay this now. And Mr. Carter has to spend six figures to get that done. Um, not that I think that would happen, but I'm a lawyer. I guess I always think worst case scenario. So uh, Matt and I have worked on that, and uh, we are comfortable with the first condition as supported in the agenda. Uh, number two condition, that is in the process of being done. I believe Mr. Tenery has already done that. He's here, so that should not be a problem. Uh, number three, obviously the, the entire property is within the 100 year flood plan. To the extent that any renovations are done uh, or closures are done that trigger uh, FEMA approval or anything with respect to the flood plan, you know, we're, we're going to have to abide by those unless there's an exemption and we have to get that exemption from FEMA. So uh, I believe, you know, the applicant understands that. Uh, I think Mr. Martin and I did try and simplify that wording a little bit in the addendum. You'll see uh, number three in the addendum here. Probably that. Uh, number four, all buildings on the property shall be properly connected to the city water and sanitary sewer system. And I'll stop right there. Uh, the applicant is currently paying city water 